All right, as promised, we are now going to talk about different basis representations for signals and images. We're going to start with signals as we've been doing up until now, and then we'll generalize this concept to uh, digital images. The basis representation we're going to use is the so-called cosine or Fourier basis. So let me start by representing or explaining what the underlying representation is. So remember what we said is that we can choose to represent numbers in base 10, base 12, base 16, base 2, whatever we want. Same things with signals. The canonical basis is nice. Um, it's the most convenient one. It's the one we're all familiar with. We don't have to state it explicitly, but it is arbitrary. We can represent numbers in any base. We can represent base, uh, vectors in any basis. And we're going to use the cosine basis for a number of very interesting reasons. But let me first describe what the basis is. So we have our uh, discrete time uh, signal here, f of x, and we're going to write it as a sum, k equals 0 to m minus 1, of uh, freak, uh, different uh, amplitude, frequency, and phase modulated cosine. So let me explain what I mean by that. So first of all, I think everybody knows what the cosine is. It's just the, uh, if, you, if you walk around a circle, the x component gives you the cosine, the y component gives you the, the sine function. Um, and the speed at which, uh, the number of the rotations you do gives you different frequencies, and where you start on the circle gives you different phases. So here, for example, I have a cosine function, I have a cosine function with a, a, a higher frequency, and so that thing right there is the frequency, 2 pi k over m. Lots of fussiness there, which just has to do with getting the units right. Um, that is the phase term. It tells me where is the, the, the shift of the cosine. So for example, here is a, a phase shifted cosine, which of course is just a sinusoid. So I can play with how many oscillations are there per period. I can play with the relative shift in terms of the frequency and the phase. And then of course, I also have the amplitude, which is the scale of the cosine or the sine function. By the way, I've written this in terms of cosine. I could have written in terms of sine since the cosine and the sine are related by a phase term right there. And all this stuff out here is just to get some of the normalization right. We don't have to worry about it. So why this basis? We'll see in a little bit why this is a powerful basis. Let me change notation a little bit because I find it clunky to, to lug around this 2 pi k over m. I'm just going to call that omega sub k. Notice again that the k is the indexing parameter here. So the amplitude depends on k, the uh, frequency depends on k, and the phase depends on k. So for each iteration, we have a different frequency, a different phase, and a different amplitude. And we are saying that a signal can be represented um, as a sum of these cosines. Now there's one important catch here, and I should say it right now, in fact, I should have said it earlier, which is we're going to assume that the signal is periodic. Why am I assuming periodicity? Because these cosines are all periodic. And that's something new. With the canonical basis, I didn't have to assume anything. I didn't have to assume periodicity. But with these cosines, I have to do it because if all the basis vectors are periodic, then all the sums of them are going to be periodic too. And it's going to turn out that's not always true, and we're going to have to deal with that when we're dealing with real-world signals and images. And we're going to have to deal with that, and we'll see an example of that later on. So this is a choice. We are choosing to represent signals in terms of the cosine basis. Why? Well, let's wait and see, and, and we'll, we'll see how powerful this representation is. Now, there's something a little weird about this representation. So in the canonical basis, no matter what my f of x was, I had the same basis. It was a bunch of shifted uh, unit impulses. If I give you two numbers, 10 and 71, and, and I assume that those are going to be on the same base. I, I wouldn't give you one number in base 16 and one number in base 12 um, and then tell you, well, add these two numbers and it's on you to do the conversion. So once we pick a basis, that basis should be fixed for all of our signals. But notice something a little weird here in terms of this phase term. That phase term is indexed on K, which means that it is changing each time and it's going to depend on the signal, of course which means that I'm going to represent some signal, and then the basis I'm choosing to represent it with is going to, it's fine to change the, the, the amplitudes, that's, the, that's outside the basis, that's the, the scalar. This isn't changing, the frequency's not changing, those are fixed, you can see that right there. But this thing is gonna depend on the underlying signal, which means if I use this basis representation that I have right here in terms of the cosine functions, every signal is gonna have a different basis. 
And that would be like me asking you to constantly compare two numbers with different bases. And that doesn't seem right. So that's an odd thing. And we're going to fix that right now. So we're gonna, the way we're going to fix this is to, re rep to remember our favorite trig identity about cosine, at least my favorite trig identity. Cos of a plus b is equal to cos of a times cos of b minus sine of a times sine of b. Okay, Standard trig identity from, from high school. So how does this help us? Well, let's go back up to here. What is this right here? It's the cosine of the sum of two things, which means I should be able to use this identity, rewrite it, and let's see what that gets us. So let's see. Cos of omega uh, k, uh, kx plus phi x is the cos of the two terms, the product of the cos of the two terms, so cos phi x, I put that up front, and cos omega kx. Uh, oops, I think that should be a minus there. That's a typo. C sub k sine phi x uh, plus sine omega x. It's, not, it's going to turn out that it doesn't matter what the sine is because we can absorb that inside of the uh, scale at the amplitude um, there. So the sine doesn't actually matter here. Now, really, really important to, to notice something here. This term is a scale factor. There's no x in there, right? This thing is f of x up over here. This thing is just a scale factor, just like c sub k is a scale factor. This is the cosine. This is now a zero phase cosine with frequency omega k. Same thing here, that's c sub k, that is a scale factor, there's no x, and that of course is our basis sine. So let's collapse these scale factors. So there's a scale factor and there's a scale factor, and I can just collapse those now into a single scale factor. So let's call the first one a sub k and the first one b sub k. And again, I've absorbed that minus sign from the trig identity inside of b sub k, so I don't care where that minus sign went. Now let's see what we have. Well, this representation is starting to look a little bit cleaner in terms of that fixed basis. In particular, notice that I've now written my signal in terms of a bunch of scale, a sub k and b sub k, sines and cosines of varying frequency, but there's no phase anymore. I've given up the phase, but I've paid the price a little bit because now I've got two basis functions, cos and sine. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's still a basis. Um, I still can write my, my equation, and it's still um, represented. And so we went from a basis of amplitude modulated, frequency modulated, phase modulated cosines to amplitude modulated, frequency modulated, sines and cosines. So that is the sine and the cosine span the entire space. Okay, good. So now, if we have a signal that is, and I'm not going to prove this because it's a little bit involved, but if I have a signal that's periodic, um, it can be represented as using this basis. Um, and now the question we want to ask is the same question we asked before. Well, what is a sub k and b sub k? This, this, is, sort of an, this is sort of a statement. You can represent the signal as a sum of cosines and sines. But how? That was like me saying I can represent a signal in terms of shifted unit impulses. How? I took a dot product between the signal and the unit impulses. How do I do it here? Well, it's going to turn out, or it turns out, that the cosines and the sines are an orthonormal basis. And I'm not going to prove that, um, but what it means is that take any of these basis vectors, um, the kth basis vector, and their unit length, and take a dot product with, with another cosine, and they will be zero. They form an orthonormal basis. And if they form an orthonormal basis, then through that linear algebraic picture that we saw earlier, I can tell you exactly what a sub k and b sub k is, they are simply a dot product of the signal with the underlying basis. And that's exactly what I've written. So I have the dot product between f is simply the sum from l equals 0 to m minus 1, that's the length of the signal, of this, each element of the sig of signal times the corresponding kth basis vector. So notice here k is the k over here, and now I'm indexing on l. So I'm taking a dot product just like I did with the unit impulses but it's now a dot product with a cosine. And the only reason this works is, again, because this basis, like the canonical basis, is orthonormal. The, unit, the, vector, the basis vectors are unit length, and they are perpendicular to each other. Again, a very powerful concept in basis representations, because then this part is very simple. All right, that's a lot of notation um, for a very relatively simple idea. So let's make sure we understand the idea, and then we'll talk about the notation. The idea is that the choice of basis is somewhat arbitrary. There are convenient basis representations that we use all the time. Base 10, canonical basis for vector spaces and for our signals and our images. 
Um, but there's a choice that you've made there. You have chosen to use a base 2, a base 10, a base 16 representation. Um, and with signals and images, sometimes that choice is convenient. So that unit impulse response is nice because I can look at the image and that's visually appealing. But it's not always the best representation for computer vision or image processing algorithms that need to reason about images in a way that maybe we are not necessarily going to reason about. And what we're going to see is that this representation, the so-called Fourier representation, named after, of course, Joseph Fourier, based on cosines and sines, has some very, very interesting properties both in, in 1D signal processing, audio, and in image processing, and in computer vision, and has a really elegant relationship to the convolution sum that we saw earlier.